Good afternoon, after everyone. Uh, my name is André van Delft. I'm going to talk about reactive programming with algebra. I intended to do this uh, together with my mate uh, Anatoly Kmetiuk from uh, Odessa, Ukraine, but unfortunately he didn't get a, um, a visa in time for the US. And Anatoly is a um, student of law in Odessa. He's only 20 years old. I myself, I'm 54 years old and I'm from, from Holland. So I'll start with an introduction, why programming is still hard and what kinds of problems I want to solve with this uh, algebraic uh, approach, which stems from um, the algebra of communicating processes. And I'll give some history about this. Then I'll present um, my implementation of this language subscript, which, which extends uh, Scala. And maybe I'll uh, de demo a debugger. And then I'll show how you can also model data flow, um, like, a twi like for a Twitter client, and also some actor uh, programming for this. So programming is still hard because main programming languages are uh, good for batch processing, they have intended to be that way. And idioms that have been uh, neglected are things like um, uh, non-deterministic choice, like you have in BNF and uh, in yet another compiler compiler. And also data flow, like you have in the Unix uh, pipes, on the, in Unix shell. Now, in functional languages, you see more and more support of, for these uh, idioms. I think it could be a bit more um, I call it um, uh, consistent or, or m maybe more in a uniform way. Now, algebra, well, we know it, we can make the, um, describe numbers with the algebra and logic. And as a matter of fact, you can also describe model processes. And you can think of Boolean algebra extended with things that can happen, not just truth values. And then the, the, um, the, the or in Boolean algebra remains the or. Um, you have a choice between processes, but the end of Boolean algebra becomes and then. So one process goes before the other. And this way, you can model a lot of uh, things. Um, so what's the, what's the background of this? And what does it have to do with lambda? Um, Calculus. Um, lambda calculus was um, created in the 1930s by, by Church and, and Turing. And one of their helpers was um, Stephen Kleine. And uh, Turing invented this uh, Turing machine. And then in 1943, there was a paper on how the brains work for, by Pitts and McCulloch. And that inspired John von Neumann for his CPU model. But it also inspired uh, Kleine to think about the mathematical model uh, for describing um, the, the, how the brain works. And this is a, a paper by uh, Kleine from uh, 1951. And um, uh, um, this is also the basis for um, um, a formal language theory and automata. And well, nice uh, piece here of this paper is this these axioms of and and or, but that things that can uh, happen. And this really goes also in this um, direction of uh, process algebra that we'll arrive later. Um, other things that play a role in this history is the work by Chomsky on the natural language uh, grammars. And then uh, around 1960, he had uh, BNF and the first compiler compiler. In uh, 1971, there was an Austrian guy, Bekic, who um, described the um, kind of algebra of processes. He said, uh, when two things happen in parallel, then it's a, a choice of either the first one starts and the rest goes in parallel with the rest, or the other one starts first with an action. And this way he describes um, a parallel composition in terms of sequence and choice and recursion. Um, Stephen Johnson created this uh, compiler, yet another compiler compiler. 
And Harmerman and Campbell got the idea to describe um, processes with path expressions, which are yeah, um, kind of these uh, regular expressions. And that inspired Tony Hoare um, to create CSP and Robert Milner to, uh, for CCS. And a few years later, there was this algebra of communicating processes, uh, then named process algebra, by Jan Berstam and Jan Willem Klopp in, uh, in Amsterdam. Now, Milner also um, worked on the, um, functional stuff, and he um, combined his CCS with lambda calculus, and he called this uh, pi calculus, and it made the system what, uh, so, so, so somewhat uh, more expressive. At the same time, a guy in the Leiden University, Henk Groeman, did about the same, a little bit different. I just want to show his, his, the, the main part of his um, um, paper. It's a very short paper of only, I think, four or five pages. But here you see the, um, the kind of uh, exp expressions that this uh, theory has, lambda terms, um, alternative composition, parallel composition, sequential composition, etc. And then on another page, he describes how you can um, model things like objects and, and uh, registers, etc. So I would really recommend you to have a look at this paper. It's very elegant, but maybe too short. It um, may not explain everything well enough. Um, but uh, OK, back to this um, algebra of communicating processes. Um, so you have truth values and uh, sequence and choice as uh, main operations. But there are also atomic actions. They are, uh, in theory, they are named A and B and so on. And these terms, you can express parallelism and communication, but also other operator operations like uh, disruption and interruption. And even you can add time and space and probabilities and uh, even money. There are very, quite, quite some publications on, th on these uh, subjects. Um, unfortunately, this uh, ACP is less known than these um, other theories, CSP and CCS. Um, unfortunately, because I think it's a bit, little bit neater uh, mathematical approach. And it has been applied to uh, verified communication protocols and um, production plants, railways, um, uh, coffee machines and, uh, uh, and money systems. Uh, the strength, uh, strength of ACP is a familiar syntax and uh, precise semantics. You can do reasoning by term rewriting. And um, uh, also a very nice feature is that events, things that we consider as input things, uh, are just actions. So basically there are five um, axioms in the in process algebra, you have these five also in, in Boolean algebra. And there is, the, there is, the, there is these um, special elements, zero and one. Zero is now called deadlock, the process cannot do anything. And one is called empty process, it's a process that has immediately success. And these axioms have been um, written in such a way that you can also apply them as a term rewrite system from left to right. So, an example of, of the reason that you can do with this is suppose you have a, a process x plus 1 and then y. So, we have the process x or we have immediately success and then we do y. What does it mean? We can apply uh, this rule, distribution, and then we get uh, x and then y or 1 and then y and apply then the other rule here. So, it means x and then y or just y. So Adding one makes a, a process optional. You can also um, define the parallelism this way. And here you see the axiom, the main axiom. Um, two par processes in parallel means that one goes first and then the rest is in parallel. Or the other starts with an action and then the rest is in parallel. Or they, these two processes, they start, start by communicating and then the rest of the processes are, are in parallel. So 
Therefore, you have uh, some additional axioms for, uh, for auxiliary operators. Uh, I won't give the uh, uh, complete axioms, but interesting here is that um, you only have to define um, what these axioms do in uh, quite a few, uh, only a few uh, cases. So the left-hand side can be of the form of an addition or a multiplication but uh, where the start uh, is an atomic action, or a one or a zero. So in this way you can define many more um, of these, um, um, uh, of these kinds of uh, operators, like for disruption and interruption. So this is only one approach, uh, so this is an algebra, it, said it defines rules the, uh, um, on which uh, to which processes uh, must um, uh, obey. There are also other um, ways to define such operators, and th those are uh, structural operating, operational semantics uh, rules. So I won't go into those. And now there have been ACP language extensions. The first one, even before ACP existed it itself, it was uh, Jan van der Bos, 1918, in, um, he, got, he made the system, the input tool model, it was an extension to Pascal or Modula later. And Van der Bos was um, influenced or inspired by uh, these path expressions by Habermann and Campbell. Um, then I, uh, in um, 1985, I started to work at the uh, team of Van, of Van der Bos in uh, Leiden University. And after a few years, I picked up his uh, system and um, uh, yeah, made, um, made a branch of it, called it scriptic, and extended in sequence Pascal, Modula, C, C++, and, and then Java. Um, another implementation, um, 98-94, is what Bergstein, Clinton, Amsterdam made, Toolbus. It was more on the level of gluing things on the, together on the operating system level. And a few years ago, I decided to switch to Scala, and I redesigned the system and uh, re renamed it into a subscript. And I, originally, I meant this for, uh, for GUI controllers, like Van der Bosch did with his input tool model. And, uh, but I also added um, text parsers and, and discrete event simulation and, and laid the reactive systems like um, actors. So let me give an um, example uh, of a GUI application. Suppose you have here uh, a simple uh, search application with um, a text field and a go button. And when you press go, then some lasting search may, may start. For instance, look up in a database or, in, or on a website. And uh, after this has been done, you get the results back. Typically, how you program this in, in Java or Scala in Swing is uh, a program like this. Um, it's quite technical, lots of uh, boilerplate code. Um, you, must be, you must ensure that things happen in the appropriate threads. So background action must be, be done in a special thread and um, showing things on the, in the GUI must be done in the GUI thread. And the switching, um, yeah, here's the definition of the button and this is what happens when the button is clicked. And thereafter, you, this start thing is called, and then a thread uh, will, st will start there. And after the thread, um, well, it's here modeled by sleep, this uh, lasting uh, action. And um, thereafter, you must get uh, things back in the GUI thread. And this is quite messy, and um, I think we should uh, stop this. <laughs> <laughs> So how do, would you do this with this uh, process algebra approach? You, you, you create um, a, th a refinement called a lif, and the refinement type is here, script. That's the name that I gave it. And the first action is a, a clicked action on the search button. It's an input action, but that doesn't matter. Just like in process algebra, you can mix input and output things. Then in the GUI thread, you, you set a text, and this add GUI, um, 
annotation here, make sure that the thing uh, will run in the appropriate thread. So at the annotation is part of the language. This GUI thing is part of the, of the library that uh, goes with it. And just we'll make sure that uh, this swing utilities invoke later or invoke and wait uh, method is called. <coughs> Thereafter, we do something in, in, a, in a new thread, and you see it with by the asterisks. And finally, you will um, go back to the uh, GUI thread and um, print the results there. And we iterate uh, these two, three dots kind of mean the while true. Um, just like in Scala, there is a sequential composition here. Um, you can uh, express these be, be using semicolons, and also by new lines, but also by um, um, uh, white space. With, but then it has a, a, a higher priority. But we'll see that later. Now, when you have uh, such a GUI application, you may want to have uh, more buttons, and you don't want to write every time they're clicked. Uh, and for this, the, the Scala uh, feature of implicit is, um, is nice. And using this feature, you can, you can get rid of the, all this clicked. And whenever the <coughs> compiler sees and counters a, a button, then it will insert this clicked uh, wrapper for you. Now, we can, we can write this also in a, in a different uh, fashion with more refinements. So, we can say a live is, uh, is an, is an um, reputation of search sequences, and the search sequence consists of several phases, and we can write this uh, here. So, effectively here, we see the same as in the, in the previous uh, slide. Now, let's um, see how we can make this a program a bit more powerful. So, for instance, we want to have alternative kinds of input, not just the button, not just the button, but also the enter key for starting the search. Or we want to be able to cancel using a button or the escape key. Or we want to be able to exit and using a button or using the close uh, box. And then we must confirm, of course. Are you sure? We only want to um, uh, have this go button only enabled when the search text field is not empty. And you also want to have some progress indication. So how would we uh, program that? Uh, for this, I'll try to do some, um, I could try to do some live coding, but first, but that's a bit risky. So I'll first show how the program works and then I'll code it. <laughs> so I, I hope you can uh, see it here. Um, this is um, on top. There's the empty text field. The go button is disabled and the cancel as well. I type something, the go button is enabled. I can say go here. And then the search is ongoing and we have some feedback. We can do cancel or go again. Or cancel, go, and we can press exit and we get here confirmation. Meanwhile, the search uh, went on. And we can say, are you sure? No. And if you look well at it, this cancel thing is, that's this exit thing is also a kind of loop in itself. It's a loop of waiting for the, the exit button and then displaying this dialog while, um, um, while, while, while you're not sure. So now I'm sure. Let me try to um, do the, some uh, live coding here. So we have, um, um, we have these search commands. It's uh, right now a search button. But uh, I can just add now a key enter. So uh, this key enter will be picked up by the compiler. Uh, and it will um, do an, another implicit conversion to a script which says key pressed with the uh, enter key as a parameter. And what we are doing now here is we add a button to a, a character. We are not adding to processes textually. So in fact, we have now 
an algebra not just of processes, but of anything, any kind of things that for which implicit conversions uh, exist. And that, uh, I think that's a nice idea that um, is inspired by, by the Scala feature. And an idea that can, can have also, uh, can also be of uh, theoretical interest. Now, the, the cancel command, so like, likewise. Um, the exit command, we have the exit button and the window closing event. So we can ju write it just like this. Um, to cancel search, yeah, we have to go to the main sequence here. So we have a search command and then on the new line, we have here now the sequential composition with these uh, spaces, which bind them more tighter together. And so I can now also um, have here the cancel search. And cancel search is uh, preceded by this slash, which means uh, cancellation or disruption. So as soon as you start this cancel search, then the rest is uh, stopped. Um, another thing, L let's do the exit uh, process. So exiting, so we start with an exit command, then we um, ask in the GUI thread for the confirmation dialog. And the confirmation dialog will result in a Boolean, and we'll have to apply the result with this Boolean. And for this, I've got now a, um, a data flow um, op uh, operator available. And so the result of the confirm dialog goes to the right to um, uh, this while thing. So that's uh, X thing. Um, yeah, two other features. There is this this guard uh, that, that we need. So we want to um, to ensure that this go button is only enabled when the text field is not empty. I'll call this um, if, um, what I'm adding here is a search guard. So a search guard is something that shines through when um, the text field is um, not empty. But it has to be re-evaluated every time an event happens in the text field. So how does, does it work? Um, I have to go, um, oh yeah, I'll, I'll write it here. Oh yeah, it's already here. So for the search card, it's on this line. Um, well, what we do is we test on the, the contents of the search text field. If it's empty, then we are allowed to, to get, uh, get away. And we, there's, there's a notation for this. Um, it's two dots, which means a repetition, but we can also exit at this, at the, at this point. So there's a kind of one in, in here, in the sequence. If the text field is not empty, then we uh, iterate for, uh, we cannot, we also iterate, but we cannot uh, end there. But we have to uh, re-evaluate when there's uh, an event. So we'll, um, so that, uh, we'll write it down here. An event in the text field. So that's uh, how this uh, guard works. And the last thing is the, this uh, progress monitor. Oh no, the, uh, I forgot this, um, this exit uh, process. We, we still need to uh, activate this. And we can just activate it here as a parallel process to the rest. And this is not normal parallelism. Normal parallelism is written down with, it, with an ampersand do things to do things uh, together but now I've got a kind of um, um, or parallelism here and uh, logically the, the live uh, the life of this um, uh, application is done when either left hand side or the right hand side of this parallel or operator is uh, is ready 
Um, and on the left-hand side, we have an eternal um, loop, so that will not never be ready. But when this do exit is, is ready, then this success goes upstairs, uh, uphill, and then th the entire lift script is ready. So then um, the program ends if the do exit is, is also ready. And last uh, thing is uh, the progress monitor. I'll also um, apply here this OR parallelism. And just to speed up, I'll show you how this, what this progress monitor do, uh, looks like. So it's an uh, eternal loop of uh, setting something in the GUI thread and then uh, sleeping um, some time. It's an eternal loop, no problem, because we have here this uh, OR parallelism again. And when the search action itself is, is ready, then the progress monitor will also disappear. So we have here a combination of parallelism and logic and, and time. And it works. So that was the um, live coding. Um, maybe it's also nice to, to show how you um, can visualize the uh, execution of this. Um, there's a... Um, if you uh, would uh, download this, there's a, a GitHub a re repository for this uh, uh, application, and you can easily uh, make a clone of this. And then you enter something like Gradle run or Gradle debug in your, um, on your command line. And on Gradle debug, it will start uh, checking everything, loading the appropriate uh, jar files. And now we have uh, load here debugger, and I'll make it better visible. Think around here. Is it visible? Yeah. So the application is now about to start. And on the left here, we have um, uh, a kind of static um, sy abstract syntax uh, tree of the application, which says live. And then there below, you, you have this parallel composition. Uh, and you see this do exit and the search sequences. And on the right, we see, see how, how far the execution has uh, <coughs> come. And we can step through this. So this um, parallel com operator is activated. And then on the left-hand side of this parallel operator, uh, the sequential operator is activated. And then this um, um, uh, looping construct, uh, which says, well, I'm quite this looping thing is, uh, behaves neutrally, which means uh, in a context of a, of a semicolon of sequence, it, it will have success. It will be report the success uh, upwards. And the semicolon gets this success from the, from the left-hand side. Then it decides to go on with the next operand. And it, it waits a little to give other operands uh, time to, uh, to do things. And now the, the right-hand side of this uh, semicolon is, uh, is activated, etc. And many of these uh, operands behave almost uh, like the same. There are differences. Some behave logically like an AND, others logically like an OR. But uh, there is quite much in common. That's why the implementation of this is relatively simple. So we can um, go on with the... Um, <coughs> with this and can automate it. I can um, enter something here and then you see how uh, things are uh, then uh, happening. Yeah, I should enlarge it a bit. So there's uh, all kind of, kind of mes messaging uh, in this graph. Uh, successes and activations, yeah. deactivations. Also exclusions, um, for instance, in the, uh, for the, in this uh, plus op operator, if an, an atomic action happens in one operand, then the other operand is uh, completely uh, removed. So I can do the exit, get the are you sure. Meanwhile, the, the system is waiting, and there's no um, polling or so. so Right now, there's no CPU um, usage until I say yes. Then, uh, then this um, do exit command will happen, and um, 
thing will just stop. So that's uh, a bit how, um, how it works on a low level. I have to uh, skip through this. So we have these uh, scripts, and um, these are refinements. They, they'll translate into um, uh, just Java, uh, Scala methods. They are invoked um, from a Scala with an executor. And the default executor is quite deterministic, but you can also, uh, in principle, have a uh, more probabilistic uh, executor. And one other thing, uh, yeah, in process algebra, two processes can communicate and the result, or two atomic actions can communicate and the result is another atomic action. Uh, and it appears to be handy to have, to, uh, to have the ability of two scripts uh, communicate and the result is another script, not just an atomic action, but something more general. And it's also possible to have uh, three or more partners in communication. And in a way, you can also say that uh, a single par partner is also kind of communication. It's a, a script call. It's a, a communication with only one partner. And it, uh, um, it's a kind of, uh, well, this, this communication here is kind of generalization of the call mechanism. So you have one callee and um, one or more callers at the same time. And you can use this, for instance, to synchronize send and the receive, uh, sending and receiving processes. So the implementation, um, this is a bit old, I think. I think we have now, we, we have um, uh, uh, put the syntax support in the Scala compiler. Um, this became a bit uh, messy, so we're now uh, on our way with uh, a version that does the syntax uh, in the parboiled. Um, and then we, we generate a Scala code and that's uh, fed into the Scala compiler, and a, a few macros do some uh, some type checking. And so, if you have a script, a simple script, then uh, this essentially what this um, uh, parsing phase or first phase does is make a, st a kind of structure where you see similar elements like sequence and alternative composition and so and so on. So it's it, it's not a real big deal what happens here. In principle, you don't have this special syntax. Uh, it's, it's not really necessary. I think it just looks more beautiful than um, the version with more parentheses and, and braces. There's also this uh, VM, which keeps track of all these uh, trees and which maintains this dynamic uh, call graph. And to uh, handle these uh, swing events, there's a, a module and this uh, debugger is also not, it's about 550 lines. And the controller of this debugger is also, has also been created in, in subscript it, with its own VM then. So this is, um, these are the scripts that control the, the GUI of the, of the debugger. And um, two years ago, I presented this at the uh, Scala team at the EPFL. And then I had this, um, exit process um, here in a, in a bit different fashion with a local variable that, that had to be set and, and so on. Um, and it, it didn't really fit. And afterwards, Evgeny uh, Bermarco told me, get rid of the VARs. So that's why that, that uh, made me think. And that's why I came up with this uh, alternative to do this with a uh, data flow. And uh, for this, you also need um, lambdas um, because um, the the operators, uh, the operands of this uh, of such a data flow arrow, the, the right hand side, is in principle a lambda. And here you see a simple arrow, and on the right hand side you see um, yeah this R arrow, this, which is a Scala idiom. Then you see some real uh, subscript syntax. These uh, square brackets, which means we get now uh, a script um, process inside. 
So this is a scalar function which, which um, starts with a Boolean and gives us a, a process which tells us, uh, um, which is an iterator for these uh, scripts. Um, another way to write this down is to get rid of um, these uh, square brackets. Um, and I found this syntax with a little bit longer arrow. Um, you could also uh, just get rid of this, uh, this R and uh, use this scala idiom with an underscore. It, this does not work uh, at the moment. And another thing is to put this, this uh, parameter R inside this arrow. And what, what you need to do for this, so these scripts then need result, uh, results, like uh, methods have um, return values. So you need to be able to declare them, you need to um, do something with these. And these results are packed in a try because things can go wrong and then you may want to have an uh, exception. It's a bit like what you do in, um, in futures. And sometimes you have um, a multiple of these operands that can have a result and you want, want to um, select which uh, operands, uh, of, of which operands these results are, are used. And for, for now we have this um, annotation with these uh, uh, carrot symbols. But this, this is quite new, it, it's, we're still thinking about this, how to do this. We're also looking at uh, what um, parboiled uh, does. And, and there, I think I, I really like uh, the power of uh, parboiled in, the, in this respect. Uh, data flow is uh, with this arrow, but you can also have exception flow. So uh, when the left-hand side goes wrong, uh, ends in uh, as a zero in failure, then we can uh, have uh, propagate the exception to the next thing. Or we can have this ternary use of a, a data flow uh, construct. So we start with x. When things go wrong, the result goes to y. Or when uh, something went wrong, then we pass the exception on to z. And we can put uh, also information inside these arrows. And uh, this is kind of syntactic sugar to generate um, these typical uh, Scala uh, partial functions that handle the things on the right side of the arrow. And it's a, a relatively small transformation that the compiler does here. So everything that you can see in Scala uh, um, uh, exception handling or in um, um, partial functions you can do, do also here. Another, just another example for this data flow is um, some Slick 3 code that I found um, uh, last week or the week before that via Reddit. So we have here a Slick query and you get, you get the result of this uh, query and then you must say, or, or you, you, now you're prepared to get, to get this result for, of this query. And then you say, let's, um, let's make a future to run this uh, in the, on the database. And finally you say what, what would happen on success of this future, you'll print the result. In principle, this, we can improve on this. So we have the same query and with this data flow operator, um, we can um, uh, let the result of this query flow immediately to the, um, to the print uh, statement. Only we need a um, an implicit conversion, which does about the same as you see above. But this way you can get rid of a lot of uh, boilerplate code. So we, you don't really need to write all these uh, things every time you write a new query. If you have only one query in your program, it doesn't matter that much. But it, I think it's good to make your program shorter. Another example um, I would like to demonstrate, yes, I have still time, is a Twitter search client. Um, and I was um, inspired by this, by this reactive programming course um, on Coursera, maybe you've uh, done this. And you had this, um, this um, example with, uh, with a GUI uh, presented by Eric um, Meyer. Uh, personally, I didn't really like this uh, solution with uh, futures. 
because the code is uh, quite, um, yeah, I, I find it hard, uh, hard to, to read. Now, what is, does this uh, Twitter example uh, do exactly? So you can enter a search string, and then, in principle, you're going to search um, on Twitter every time that the search string uh, changes, but you don't want to do that too often, because if you do it too often, then Twitter will say, stop, you're, you, you're asking too much, and that, then you have to wait a few minutes. So what we'll do is, um, when the, uh, the contents of this uh, text field changes, then we'll wait um, a few uh, hundred milliseconds, and only then, when we have not started typing again, they will uh, send the, um, the request to Twitter. So the, the typical way to do this with these futures, or you, we, we would be like this. We would need a kind of interruptible uh, futures. And I don't want to dive into details of this uh, code, but personally I don't like all these um, braces and so on. Um, and I get a bit lost in the, in the control flow, and I, I don't understand why I have to write here flat map and they're not complete and so on. Or I, I, I do understand it, but I really, really don't want to know. Logically, there's a flow from, from top to the, to the bottom. By the way, it's a strange layout, but uh, you'll, I, I, I do that more often. So how do, would you do this um, with this uh, algebraic approach? We'll have a live script which says we'll initialize first, and then we have uh, lots of searches. And a search is, um, is a sequence that can interrupt itself or disrupt itself. Um, so the, the search sequence starts with uh, any event in the, in the search field. Then you wait a little, and you do, do the search in the background. And if meanwhile another character is typed, if, if you're waiting, then you see here kind of iteration, and the next thing, the next instance of this main sequence will disrupt the previous one. <coughs> but anyway, the results um, um, after the search has done in the in the background, then we'll, the results will be uh, updated in the GUI, uh, or if something went wrong, you'll get an error message. Um, yeah, and here I. Um, I do these uh, searches in, the, in separate uh, threads. And maybe you don't like it, maybe uh, you want to have uh, another mechanism with th thread pools or so, or you could also, um, um, well, in principle you can um, replace these threads here by um, the futures that we have seen in the previous example. And then uh, you get this, you have here the, the, these interruptible futures again, you call them here with wait and search. And now you, again, you have these implicit conversions from the futures to, to scripts. So, um, so, uh, so uh, if you have a nice uh, future available for something, you can easily get the result of it and, and process it um, like this here with, uh, with, uh, with this da data flow operator. And an implicit conversion would look like this. I won't go into the details. Um, there is some work really being done here in this uh, method. And um, it, it, it's quite technical code. But here on the right, you, you see something peculiar. It's a kind of atomic action, but the dots say that uh, it must be triggered by something else. And that's uh, what this annotation does. The annotation says, when the future completes, then will there is this um, piece of code here. There will be executed, and uh, maybe it will uh, succeed. <coughs> uh, and this way, with this this construct, we can um, combine all these input actions with normal actions. I think it's also possible to um, convert uh, the other way around, scripts to futures, but there is some uh, impedance uh, mismatch. Uh, these, these futures are not well, normally they're, they're hard to uh, cancel. Um, so if you would go, um, uh, and these futures, they don't have an, uh, an optional success as you have with 
these uh, processes when you have um, can add one to a process. So there is some impedance mismatch, but you can do some co combination in principle. Another thing I want to show is um, uh, these how to combine with the actors. So one of the problems I see with ACA actors is that the internal uh, behavior of actors is quite relatively hard to uh, program, especially when you have to use futures and, and so on, or do uh, something in parallel, some things in parallel, for instance, go to uh, different um, actors. Um, let me show how you could do this. A simple example is a ping pong um, system. So a ping actor will, um, will send uh, hello, hello, and then terminal to the other actor. The other actor, you can create a lift script for this and um, say, um, uh, this is a kind of receive thing in this uh, actor. So we, here it wants to receive hello um, um, in, in an infinite number of times in sequence. But in parallel, we can also terminate. And it's our parallelism, then the total will end. Because I could also have written here a slash. In this case, it doesn't matter that much. You can also have an implicit conversion, and then you, it starts looking like a, um, a, just a, lang a language syntax. Uh, another example, which is not probably a, a real good system, it's a, it's a, a, a data store with a, a proxy and a server. The idea is that uh, a client can send an information request. The proxy will send it on to the, the store. It will answer some, uh, some data. Then the proxy will send a, a details request based on this first answer. And goes back to the store and you've got details back and that goes to the, the client. So uh, the, the hard thing is to describe the behavior of this proxy. So in uh, typically ECA idiom you would, um, I think, uh, do something with these, um, with these state machines. Uh, you get uh, three states waiting for a request and uh, ready for data, ready for details. I think it's a nice idiom, but it also, uh, also looks a bit like go-to programming, and, and go-to here uh, is named now become. So I'm, uh, I th also think this is too long. One way to do this in subscript is like this. We can uh, nest the handlers of these, um, message, um, these, these message handlers. So in principle, that make, gives uh, back more power it gives more power to the programmer, but nesting in general complicates uh, matters. Uh, I, I really don't like parentheses, and and here these uh, brackets, uh, these pairs are also kind of parentheses. And so I'm not going to explain how exactly this works because I don't need to. We have a better solution, and that's uh, with the data flow. And what does it say? We get an information request in the kind of in the receive method of the actor. Then what do we do? We get the, the script that starts from this arrow, goes by a, a few lines back, further on. Um, we send the request on to the data store, but we do it with this uh, question mark. Question mark returns a future that will, at the later stage, give back the, re the, the reply from this uh, data store. Then, um, we should have here an implicit conversion um, in scope, which uh, picks the result of the future and, um, um, and sends the, the resulting data uh, on to the, to the data store. Uh, 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 well, it's a, it, it picks off the, this data, creates a details request, and sends that, that's, that on to the data store. And again, we get the future. And at the later stage, we'll receive the, the details back from the data store, and then finally we'll send the, the sender the, the details. Now, the syntax for this, uh, so this is, uh, this is where it's a uh, work in progress. So it's not entirely clear how we can really, um, well, we can, we, we must pick up the, this, this results um, and, and make, apply this implicit conversion. So it's, it's some of a work in progress, but I think this way you can model this uh, actual behavior better than currently done uh, often. Especially, I was 
personally uh, terrified by this uh, last exercise uh, assignment in the um, reactive programming course uh, two years ago. Uh, I find it really hard, and that's one reason. Uh, I, I, I managed to solve it by, by rewriting things in this uh, process algebra fashion. Um, I, I think this kind of idiom, if you don't want to program in subscript because you don't like to have another compiler or so, then still writing this uh, down on, um, on a sheet of paper in this style can help you reasoning um, about what the actor does. Now there's an implementation, I won't go into too many details, but actors give nice uh, hooks to, um, to dive in the system. Um, it's not so much done, but, but if you have, um, what the compiler does is if you have this kind of expression here, um, with such a message sender, what does it do? It, it creates a call to, um, to a method in, uh, in subscript actor, which is a, a subclass of uh, just a uh, normal echo actor. So the transformation is not really, not really big. And here's the implementation of this uh, method. It's quite technical, but it's not too complicated. Um, now I've got a few more minutes. Um, just where, where are we now in the, the space of uh, language uh, paradigms? So let's start with imperative um, uh, languages like assembly and C. You can add uh, lambdas, you get, then you get uh, typically things like Haskell and Lisp. Or you can add uh, objects, you arrive at uh, C++ or Java, or do both. Smalltalk, uh, Scala, and Java 8. Or you can go in another direction, which is, um, in my view, the declarative style, as you have in Pro Prolog and Yark, but I would also say Unix command shell with this um, pipeline operator. And if you go and do, if you add objects again, then you get uh, Java CC, the Java compiler compiler. If you do it all, then you arrive at a subscript, but also in my view, part boiled, and maybe also a few other um, things that that arise now. Maybe also these um, these uh, streams that you now get with uh, Scala and C and so. So that's where we are, I think, in the language landscape. Now, conclusion. So I, I think um, this way you can do efficient programming. The execution is a bit less ex um, efficient. Typically the system on the on um, uh, computer uh, does about 10,000 um, actions per second, maybe 30,000. If we start um, optimizing, I think we can reach up to uh, 100,000, but not much more. And if you compare that to uh, actors, it, it, those handle about a million uh, messages per second. So we, we, we lag behind and we cannot uh, make it up all. So you should only use where applicable. But for GUIs, this uh, speed is uh, often uh, enough. The implementation, yeah. So we're working um, currently, well, we have currently uh, this Scala branch. We are almost, uh, I think we're about halfway to uh, move to a power boiled. It's Anatoly in Odessa does this. Um, uh, it's an open source project. Here's the, um, the, the, web, the website and the, the GitHub. And uh, there is uh, still much to do. What, what we would like to do is uh, go to this, uh, to the JavaScript site, just to have this um, stuff uh, working in the browser. Just to look, look uh, using Scala.js. Um, and um, maybe not just in the browser, but we also would like to see whether we can do something in the uh, area of uh, Node.js. I don't know whether we can improve on something, but it's um, nice to find this out. Another thing that's still to be done is this ACP style communication. And uh, this, uh, that has a bit low priority. We first want to have the rest completely stabilized. There's also lots um, of things um, to discover also on a more theoretic uh, basis. I've, got, I've um, compiled about 10 topics in a uh, paper that I've stored on uh, archive.org. Now, um, it's a bit a weird project. Uh, I've been busy for, for tens of years uh, on this. And only in the last few years I got 
a little bit success that I can speak on conferences. Uh, this is the first time that I'm allowed to speak in the, in the, on this side of the Atlantic Ocean. I'm very grateful uh, to John to give me this opportunity. Um, I, I've been more lucky on the other side. So I've been at uh, Scala Days, Scala Workshops, Scala Exchange uh, last December, also Lambda Days last February in, in Krakow. But, but still, um, uh, I, I would like to express some fear that I have for this project um, in, in the spirit of the keynote uh, talk of yesterday. So my fear is that, that we are really onto something, that we, really, we can uh, give a better basis for programming, uh, a kind of a more uniform alternative to all these different things that we have now with parboiled and, uh, and futures and other things. And, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not completely sure, but I think we're, we're really on to something. But the, uh, especially the um, interest of, by the industry is not that big. And also the interest by the academic community. It's for me quite impossible to get a, get a job at the university just to do this. I can get a job there, but I must do uh, different projects and I'm not really interested in that. So, um, I am a bit afraid that this project can just die. Um, because of um, no, not enough uh, involvement. Uh, I really would like to invite you, if you have some, some, uh, some interest, if you have ideas to, uh, to improve the system or just to co cooperate or to participate, um, so just to, to, uh, to join me, and that can, could uh, improve the system. Uh, and I, there are really, I think there are really some, some gems or, or gold mines here to be to dis discovered and uh, exploited. And it just needs to, uh, some more uh, attention of the community. So if you want to discuss the, the opportunities with me, please uh, have a talk. Um, Afterwards, and I'll give you then a very amazing Dutch uh, cookie called <laughs> Stroopwafel. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your attention, have you? And, uh,